And let's see, folks are coming in. Oh, I see. All right. Well, we're live. It is uh, December 13. Uh, for many people, a lucky day, perhaps. Um, I'm reminded that yesterday was my parents' wedding anniversary, but they're both deceased. I don't know how many years it would have been. Long, long time. Probably 90 years by now. Um, and uh, things are uh, interesting. Uh, the feds are holding on to the rates. The stock market is um, hobbling along. The economy seems to be looking okay. But before we get going, we have a great guest today to talk about data and the enterprise. Uh, let's have our own John Sibley Butler play some music. Well, King, you got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. When the road is rough ahead and you're miles and miles from your real nice bed, just remember what your old pal said. You got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. You got a friend in me. If you got troubles, I got them too. There isn't anything I would do for you. We stick together and we see it through. Cause you got a friend in me. Woo! You got a friend in me. Yay! <laughs> Well done, well done. You're muted, Joellen. How are you doing, John Butler? I am just doing fine. I just had all morning meeting with Sam Alexander, who does fashion and, and technology here in Austin, a great state of Texas and the world. Meeting with two entrepreneurs who had great ideas to, to solve different kinds of problems. So I had a great meeting with uh, Sam Alexander, and uh, he, he's very, very knowledgeable in, in everything we do in technology. So what's interesting, of course, is that people are now still trying to solve a problem. But I woke up this morning to an editorial, a news story in the uh, Austin American Statesman, where ERCOT said that uh, we, we might have to prepare for another whiteout in Austin. Uh, Lou Ellen, what that means to us, it means that Austin all of a sudden becomes Boston and we cannot move anywhere. And what the article did in the American Statesman was to really, really delineate the probabilities that we can have another situation like we had two years ago. And that's the first time in, in the history that I can remember anybody predicting a snowstorm where everybody would be paralyzed uh, again. And I think that's right in our subject matter uh, today. The world is still a mess um, with the university campuses going crazy. We had, um, I believe, uh, presidents who could not answer a simple question uh, that says, well, you know, do you want to kill everybody in Oklahoma? You should say, Senator, what kind of question is that? <laughs> well, certainly we don't, we, nobody wants to do that. And then you would say, well, you know, but we do have open debate, you know, on college campuses. So that's all in the news. And the economy is very, very interesting. And uh, if you look at the way I look at the economy, we cannot talk about our economy without talking about China and without talking about the Middle East and the petroleum bell runs in the Middle East. We can't have a war because that would really disturb the, the flow of oil uh, to China that makes uh, everything. But certainly we've got to come, to come to terms with what's going on in Europe now and what's going on with the Israel, the Israeli uh, uh, kind of conflict. But through it all, Christmas is coming. Uh, through it all, we hope to solve um, many, many problems. And more importantly, through it all, we are still depending upon the nature of technology to somehow solve the evolving problems, including, of course, that with the grid. Well, that's quite interesting, Johnny. I was with 
I, I handed it, you know, excuse me, uh, United States Energy Association virtual press briefing. I host these once a month on Monday, and we had um, Pablo Vegas, uh, the president of Erfurt, on, and he pointed to a tight supply situation, but he felt very strongly that the supplies were adequate and that uh, Urquhart would make it through no matter what was thrown at it this time, partly because they had worked on very, very hard on weatherization across the state, but also because there's been uh, a much greater emphasis on the supply of natural gas and making sure that that is adequate in a crisis. He wasn't entirely, he did not say we will have large surpluses, etc., but he did seem to uh, believe that um, Texas would get through. Yesterday on a webinar uh, conducted by Denton's, the large uh, law firm, uh, um, Melanie Kinderdine, who is, uh, was with DOE for many years and has a close associate of earning my knees uh, in, a, in a think tank, she was caustic about the design of ERCOT, the, the energy only uh, market that was designed uh, to operate without the normal backups and, and resilience that is required in the rest of the country. And she was really uh, categorical in pointing to the weaknesses of this system. Uh, there have been some modifications to it, but certainly nothing dramatic, and your legislature went home without making any decisions that would improve the situation. Uh, so it remains, a, you know, a very tight situation in Texas. And you have other tight situations. Water, I was <clears throat> looking at the situation around Dallas. And water is a serious problem in much of Texas and could cause a problem uh, if there was any period of sustained drought. So, you know, there is fragility in Texas and, and, and it behooves Texans to uh, do something to uh, ameliorate this fragility. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, um, Urquhart is a very interesting market because it's been designed that way since 1999 and it's worked very well. And uh, uh, a lot of people are still trying to learn and understand how it functions, and it really functions better than most people understand. And it they didn't of... function in 2021 when 246 people froze to death. That's very serious. That is in the United States of America. Can you imagine freezing to death in this rich country with all of our resources, all of our technology? And they were mostly poor people because the market didn't work because there was a lot of greed in the gas companies supplying the gas. Um, I mean, there've been innumerable lawsuits since then. Um, I, I think that I think that Texas in, in that ERCOT is in many many ways uh, a, a, a laboratory. It's a testing ground, and sometimes it succeeds magnificently, and sometimes it fails. But the basic concept of utility governance is that you don't fail because electricity is utterly essential to the operation of modern life and life stops without it as 246 lives stop during ice storm Uri in Texas. And we should not forget that. Uh, and rich people will go out, put in their own generators, etc., and the poor will be vulnerable to any perturbations, severe perturbations in the market. It is a problem. It needs more attention. It needs the legislature in Texas to look at it. And nationally, we need to get the lessons there. Interestingly, just to the north, you had other states that were also affected by URI, but had uh, reserves that were somewhat larger, moved with great alacrity to do things like introduce the burning of fuel oil when they ran out of natural gas, which people forget about fuel oil, it can still be burned in a lot of turbines. Uh, and they came through without the kind of financial penalty that Texas consumers had to pay. Uh, I think that ERCOT is in many ways a very, very interesting experiment, a very, very interesting 
independent system operator. Uh, the grid, which is the third grid in America, is extremely interesting, and it is a laboratory. But it also, a laboratory is no good unless you learn from the lessons that came out of the experiments. And uh, the question is, will we learn from the lessons which came out of the experiments in ERCOT, which is a setup radically different from that on the other two uh, networks, the Eastern network and the Western network? Yeah, let me also say that because we have been constrained by not building new power plants, we cannot new, and I'm not sure windmills and and and, and the natural movement of energy to create energy without saving well, the planet. Uh, I, it's not necessarily just new power plants. You need transmission in Texas. You have a lot of transmission uh, that hasn't been built, and so you have a surplus from wind which cannot get to the place of demand. In fact, that's a national situation where the West, which has the renewable resources of wind and uh, sun, uh, can produce the electricity, but there is no mechanism to get it east, whether it's inside Texas or whether it's from the intermountain west to the Midwest and the east, where the demand is very high. However, evolution is happening. Better connectors are being developed and move more power over the same right of way with the same pylons, that's a huge step forward. A uh, hundred hour batteries are very close at hand, we believe. Uh, one of the people on the United States Energy Association virtual press briefing, which I put together, uh, was Dwayne <coughs> Jaime, who's been on this program. Uh, and they are going for a really advanced kind of uh, picture just by the end of this decade. They are putting in carbon capture and storage on their new uh, gas turbines, which they are treating as though they were uh, 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 batteries themselves. And they are buying one of the first, probably the first deployed 100 megawatt iron air battery. Now, these have not been proved at that size, but it is indication that things are changing, that they're moving. And that technology is coming to the rescue. It's not just the case of making more uh, energy, it's the ability to store it. The weakness in the windmills is you can't store the energy and it's made in inopportune times. The weakness with solar is that it is at its most productive at noon and two o'clock in the afternoon, which incidentally, coincides with the lowest demand for the power. Uh, and only storage, it appears, will resolve that situation. Good stuff. So let, me, let, me, let, me, let me digress from you guys' conversations, which uh, I you know, have some comments. I to thought make. it was a monologue, not Amen. a conversation. Uh, I thought let, I was giving an let order. Me, you, let I me thought introduce... I was giving an order until you started talking. Let me introduce Patricia Fryer from Kinami. How are you, Patricia? I, I'm doing great. And this conversation is great to listen to. And I market technology. So so, so but, upstream. Yeah, so, 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 to, so talk to us, Patricia, real quick about Kinami and what are you all about and what's going on with your traction and the different markets you support. And, and we are always very interested in digitalization of the infrastructure in the country. So you guys play a big role in that. Yes. So I, uh, Konami is a, a software company that provides a uh, resilient, secure data mesh. And that's for complex distributed environments like edge computing, which are the things we're talking about here already. Um, there are different, so, Konami was founded by some security and storage experts who spent a lot of time working on how do we solve these difficult problems at the edge to make data resilient. One of the things I was uh, hearing was the need just in predicting this weather mm -hmm. uh, and that there's going to be this terrible storm. That's about data, but predictive analytics depends upon data and it's data gathered from sensors and systems and analysis. But that data has to be trustworthy, it has to have integrity, and it has to be get to the systems that need it when by people who need them, by people who are authorized. Mm -hmm. And so that sounds 
you know, all reasonable, but it's very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so Konami solves this difficult problem and makes, keeps data secure, protected, and available to those systems that need it. And we focus, uh, I say the edge, we can provide resilient data from edge to cloud, but edge is this giant new market where it has so many promises with autonomous, um, new autonomous systems, self-driving cars, um, sensors on bridges, which is one of the things that we're doing just for predictive analytics for infrastructure but there's challenges with the data and that's what we help solve. Well, that right. sounds interesting to me, Patricia. Let me ask you. So I'm just looking at that and I, I did go over your, um, your webpage and, and, and your before the, and all of the other information. So data, data on command is quality data on command. And so that means not only, let's go back to uh, 10, 20 or 30 years ago, when we look for data for census, we look for data, to do certain kind of things. What you're saying now is it is real time and your company provides the clean data. That means that you clean the data also for different kinds of predictive problems that anybody would have in the market. Is that true? We we do not clean data. So I'm going to separate that from it, but we help with all this data that's being generated at the edge, which is tons and, and it's ever growing and will con continue to increase the data management problem. What is huge and that is moving the data, uh, data that has, that is uh, original and provable to where it needs to be. We do, we're not doing the movement. What we do is to help take uh, data that's identified as needed and encrypt it and protect it in a way that, um, others have not done before and make sure that it's available, which means we have a, and, and how we do that is we have an intelligent policy engine that can help to prioritize and um, govern the data by rules. So, the so in other words, you can take it in the raw data and make it secure. Mm -hmm. If I want to know the number of people that's moving to Austin who happen to have a electric vehicle, the number of trucks that go down I-35, then you can provide me the raw data for me to predict uh, the wear and tear of the uh, of, of, of the highways. Yeah, we, okay. we're essentially a platform that enables someone who wants to build that application that you're talking about. Okay. So we, we are a secure data mesh that they can use. And that today our uh, customers are the US Air Force, we're in the DOD, and we're doing some things with critical infrastructure with ERCO, or ERDIC, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers R&D Center. So that what that means then, data on the edge from the internet of things, I don't have to worry about it if I have a company, if I'm the US military, I don't have to worry about that anymore. I just come to you when I need certain kinds of data for predictive things in the future. I can just re rely on, on your company. If you want your, well, I would like to say that we're a startup. So we're still okay. early and there's, you know, delivery, et cetera, and implementing things and integration is a huge part of this emerging market, uh, industrial internet of things that you're talking about. Um, it's not just the internet of things, that's data that needs to be protected because it can be hacked. There's a incident, there's, you know, numerous incidents we can point to, but um, a number of years ago, pacemakers, 400,000 pacemakers, yeah, 400,000 pacemakers were recalled because they were cons there was concern that the data could be, that hackers could put in false data and make the heart rhythms look different. And I'm not a pacemaker expert, but it sounds like when that's something implanted in someone's body, you want it to be the right data. So, so, then, so that's then, Patricia, you're really into the cloud business too. I mean, it must take, are you are you are you interacting? Do you have do you have partnerships with 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 people who have the cloud or what we call data centers? Uh, Some of our projects have... involve cloud cloud because the data is being moved there. Um, or you know, in the case of of the Air Force, we are we're doing a digital engineering project, and that's data is in the cloud, and or it can be at their local data center, or it can be 
in someone's office on their workstation, which is also edge computing. You know, people don't always understand that uh, anything out the side of the data center is the digital edge. You, I'm sitting here up at my laptop at home and that's the digital, and I don't have the protection that a data center provides. The uh, I don't have staff here to help me, <laughs> which is sometimes frustrating. <laughs> Well, Patricia, in the old days, when I was at Northwestern Graduate School, we called that the dumb computer. We didn't call it the edge. Yeah. But, and so we interacted with the mainframe, not the cloud. Yeah. Yes. So, so like it's the exact same thing. Well, I find it very interesting. And I was just asking, where do you, where do you store most of your data? Because it would take a whole lot of uh, storage space, a whole lot of electricity to maintain the data. And are you interested in, in finding places to store your data? Well, so we're not, it's not our data. We're enabling our customers right. with yeah. their data. Mm -hmm. Cloud providers, this is something Gartner's done a lot of reporting on is that cloud providers are, are developing digital edge strategies too. How can they serve these customers with their cloud services? So in some instances, applications require cloud services. Some of the things that we're doing, which are really exciting, um, our one of our showcase examples is that we're doing work in the search and rescue area and we're helping the air force to no longer have to sell hel manned helicopters out to go find missing persons in hostile environments but instead the air force would like to for to deploy a forward swarm of drones that can use uh algorithms to determine where the missing person is to pick up data, including, including biometrics, to be able to communicate that back to helicopters and ground personnel. And that's what our system can do. It's sort of the extreme case, but we can help hop data from drones back to uh, the helicopter and the other ground, the other rescue personnel. And this is what we do is we collect the data, we secure it, we distribute it across the uh, part, you know the participants in this team. And so everyone has the same real-time situational awareness, which is some of the problems that we've seen in, with things like Uvalde, which was just a, a problem of no one had the same view of what was going on and there, there was no mm -hmm. understanding. So you have to have the same view. So the real-time requirement the data availability and getting it to the right people at the right time and securely, because if you're in a hostile environment, you don't want that data to be hacked or changed. In something like Uvalde, we have privacy issues because we're dealing with students, underage students, and you can't just let anyone have a view into the classroom. So um, we provide protection at a lot of layers, a lot of levels. Um, security and and only access to the data to those who should be authorized to have the data and its use good i mean so it's all metric driven and i think that's your major uh is everything you do is metric driven and everything all the solutions are metric driven and i think that's good so 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 let's let's fantasize for a moment patricia i am a city cio i'm a utility cio i heard you talk um, I'm gonna buy your platform. Walk me through what what would I do buy your platform and what happens? So what I where we are today is we are looking for pilots in the commercial market. So mm -hmm. I'm very interested in talking to companies that are have autonomous systems, robotics, other um, IOT systems that mm -hmm. need to secure their data. Um, they can get in contact with us and mm -hmm. see if a project makes sense on the, the two sides and work that out together. It's a, uh, we're at that stage that where we're getting, we're ready to start working on pilots and then scaling those to the final solutions. Got it. I'd like to ask Patricia, uh, where artificial intelligence fits in with us. You mentioned weather. Uh, I find it very interesting that sometimes what we think of as data and the management and use of data uh, is not the same 
when we start using artificial intelligence. And utilities are looking at many ways of using AI, one of which is weather prediction. Uh, but whereas uh, current weather prediction builds on models based on huge number of inputs of the uh, real-time situation, AI does the same thing, but it goes differently. It, it basically scrapes all the historical data and creates a model out of historical data. And so far, it looks as though the AI route, bypassing contemporary live data for historical data, uh, has a superior result. Uh, so this is a very interesting situation. And how far does that extend? Uh, is in fact the, the, the data analysis that has become so important to so many areas of endeavor uh, being made in a sense obsolete or sidelined by AI using historical data and getting to the same place or a superior place? I don't know. So, so I'll first of all, I'm not an AI expert, but I work with some people who are or or have uh, and who use AI. Um, what comes to mind for me in what we're doing, and you know, I'm sure there's a place for historical data. I don't know how complete that data is. I don't know the integrity of that data, but let's just say there's very good historical data. That's certainly something an AI model would want to include. But I, one of the projects we're doing is with critical infrastructure. One of the problems we had, and this has been interesting for me too, because as a marketer, I get to go and explore markets and try to understand problems and see where we fit. So I had a little journey with this one. Um, the infrastructure around the country is aging out. You know, after my studying, I'm, I'm looking and seeing, okay, we had huge building projects in the 50s and the 60s and the highway system. And now we know all these bridges are falling down. And I've learned more about cement than I wanted to know. I'll tell you, Andres, from your professors at your university, um, I've learned more about bridge inspection than I wanted to know. And I understand much better why these things are happening, which is the, the inspe it's not the inspections that are bad, it's the regulations that are not meeting what we need today. And the materials are falling apart in the bridges and they're collapsing. And how can this happen if bridge are being inspected once a year as they should be? It's happening because what we really need to understand is is what's going on right then with the bridge. When what what is degrading at what rate? And we're working with the Army Corps of Engineers um, and the University of Nebraska on a project where there are sensors picking up, and I and I know the project has expanded now to a bridge in New Hampshire, but we have sensors on bridge, off bridge, um, subsound sensors, as well as you know imagery, and all this data is picked up at remote locations because a lot of bridges are not even necessarily um, close to the internet, right? And, there, and there's a need for data privacy because they may be owned by a railway or some other private individual. But to pick up that data and to train the models that you're talking about, it goes that the models have to be developed and trained. Once they're trained, we'll want to implement some real-time systems. You know, this is the thinking out in the future so that we can make predictive analytics and know when these bridges are going to fall down. And, you know, for in our home territory here in Texas, there was that horrible bridge collapse that going to South Padre Island, where a section of the bridge fell out in 2001, unpredicted, and eight people were killed. So those are an example of, I don't see how historical data, the, the annual um, inspection information would help whatsoever, right? But, but remember, it's not just historical data. Uh, AI is deductive. Uh, mm -hmm. It is extrapolating from that data. It is not a cold analysis of old data. It's an extrapolation using as the as the points of. Um, uh, and it's interesting what you say about bridges. By the way, is very current because today, starting yesterday, Rhode Island is in chaos 
because a major east-west bridge has been closed because it is so badly deteriorated and it was inspected and inspected but there's a lot of questions about the quality of the inspection and the uh, political uh, uh, dimension of the uh, uh, inspection um uh, i'm i'm just interested how we will how we will accommodate ai and i i don't have an answer I, I know I've done a lot of reporting on AI, which is why I have this interest in it, but also <clears throat> because it is becoming a big force in the utility industry, which I cover very closely. Um, how about, I mean, one of the things that AI suffers from is data bias. Uh, if you ask, for example, AI to predict uh, um, how many uh, students and then give you pictures of students who will pass this year, you will have a preponderance of white and Asian because of the their bias. Or if you ask AI about a doctor, they'll have a white male. If you ask her about a nurse, they'll have a black woman. Uh, this, this, this bias is deeply uh, ingrained in the data mined by AI and corrective actions are going to be very complex and difficult to bring about. Yeah, these are the 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 places I've touched AI or worked with people who are working with AI or more in places like the automotive industry that's trying to help develop predictive uh, analytics and to develop driving of uh, driver assisting systems. So it's quite different. And I see what you're talking about, the bias that's in the historical data, because of historically, those things were biased. So how do we change it? Yeah. Um, tell you know, tell us, we, before we before we leave my questioning, uh, if you don't mind, could you tell us something about yourself and how you came to be a player at Konami? So I, um, I'm an archaeology major by trade. Mm -hmm. There in, in Israel, I worked I, as an undergraduate. I was an archaeology and art history major. And when I got out of school, um, I found out you had to have a PhD for archaeology. And I wound up getting into computers. I did go back briefly for, for a PhD, but I decided there wasn't what I was looking for. So I became uh, a computer analyst and programmer. It was a time in the market where they took people who could pass a logic test and trained us. So um, I went back to business school and thought I was going to be the best IT manager ever. And instead, I learned marketing was not just about uh, consumer reports uh, analysis. <laughs> and there was a whole lot more to it. And I graduated with a focus in marketing and finance. So I came down to Austin with my husband. I mentioned before this that he was from uh, Austin and um, got connected with Microelectronics and Computer Technology Consortium. Uh, you know, some things are by luck and some things just happen. Um, and was a consultant to a project there, which rolled out. I got to be, uh, that's back in 1994. So I wound up um, getting promoted to vice president of marketing at that. And that was early internet security. Um, and it was the first, first virtual private networks serving, guess what, the electric power industry that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So um, fast forward 20 years after that, I, I wind up meeting the folks at Konami through my mentoring at Capital Factory. And they came in and started telling me about their um, technology. And I was interested in the edge at the time and working in automotive and said, hey, could you use this in autonomous, you know, a, self-driving vehicles and the, the heads nodded. Yes, this could be used there. So we had a common interest and that's, that's how it all began. So, I mean, to me, it's, it's absolutely um, where my heart is. I would say this security, um, the largest emerging market ever. And, you know, and they're a wonderful, they were a wonderful group of people. I had, it's hard to come by that mix. Yeah, you know it reminds me of logic courses at LSU. Uh, and of course, computer science came directly out of logic or philosophy. I mean, what we call computer science is nothing but Aristotle's logic. But I want to I want to ask you this uh, about, follow up on Llewellyn's 
I mean, I think that what we call the old data, that AI is dependent upon data. I mean, the more we, the more data it has, so whether or not it's, it's, it's always going to be old data. But like when we say in finance, right, financial results today does not mean it's going to be the same tomorrow. And what we have learned is that if we, it, in order to look forward 50 years in predictive models, we need to look back 50 years in predictive models, right? So uh, we know, for example, the census data for the last, since 1870 have shown a relationship between being trained, right, and income, you know, it's right. And so I guess what Llewellyn is asking um, is that the AI by definition will run on data that's, that we put out there and whether or not it predicts the future is still a major question, but it will allow us to predict in terms of the smart cities, which bridges are falling. Sure. Look at your automobile now. I mean, now you got a sensor for when the air goes low. You have a sensor for everything. We didn't have mm -hmm. that um, in the past. You know, I used to tune my cars, my 55 Chevrolet by listening to it. So Llewellyn, you're right. AI will always utilize the data that's already out there. And like us humans, in terms of predicting the future, we just have to create models, not like physics, which are lead pipe sense, but much like finance. You know, there's, I mean, the problem with financial models is that they're based on physics and people will change their minds and they're not as lead pipe as physics. So I think what, what we're saying is that let the data that's old out there, it's going to be out there. And as, as time, as T minus one uh, comes with the present, then the data perhaps will get it better, but it's all that we have. And that is a kind of, to your point, Llewellyn, I absolutely agree that it, it seems that it will perpetuate the bias rather than solve the bias in so many things that we're dealing with. Right. <clears throat> so Patricia, tell us real quick, um, you know, the year is coming to an end. What, what's a, what's ahead of you guys the next six months in terms of, of targets, partnerships? What are you guys working on? Working on some partnerships in robotics and self-driving cars. Those are, and this is a great place in Texas, but there's other, actually some connections I made at uh, your conference at uh, the Digital 360 conference. Um, so those are right in front. We have, you know, our DOD work that will continue and we'll continue to work for additional contracts there. Um, I think at, you know, I, at some point we'll do a fundraise. That's not the immediate, it's not next quarter. So, um, and in the meantime, you know, we were named a Gartner um, cool vendor for edge computing. And yeah, so definitely. I'm, I'll be personally, I'll be spending more time spreading the word with other analyst firms and um, et cetera. This is, and this is part of the early market and it's really fun for the marketer. I'll tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. Do you think that real quick, do you think that what you guys are selling, are you creating a new category? Do you have competitors? What, what does that look like in terms of a data platform? Um, you know, just curious. Do, yeah. do, do the, does the market understand what, you, what you're what you doing? You know, do they want it? Or are there, there, you're just teaching them a new way of doing security and data management? Well, so the, the market needs it. The understanding of the problem is always you know, that's, that's always the, seems to be the problem sometimes at a new market. Mm -hmm. um, Gartner says this is needed, but what, what I will say is that the old ways for security and protection and availability aren't working. It, they were built for the data center and they are solutions that address one or the other of those problems and have not been done holistically. And that's mm -hmm. the, the huge difference between what we're doing, it was built from the ground, you know, thought of and built from the, the ground up for purpose built for the edge mm -hmm. and complex distributed uh, systems. So the, you know, there isn't really anything that's, we're a software only solution, which um, 
is much different than the systems I've seen that are often hardware and software, and those have scaling issues, obviously. Mm -hmm. And what needs to happen is, so those ways that haven't been working, because we still see hacks going on, we, we hear about the security and protection tend to be an afterthought for many people until they have the problem. Mm -hmm. um, I've spoken to a lot of companies that have said, oh, we don't have a problem. We have a closed system. And then, you know, they're in the news for a huge hack uh, for all their customers and exposing things you don't want exposed, mm -hmm. but um, health data, things like that. So, um, so there is a big awareness problem here. And, and uh, the other difficulty that I see, so I'm just kind of talking about what are some of the challenges? It's that many people who are building autonomous systems are doing the system and the robotics and they they put the the data platform as a, oh someone else does that you know i was work, went to a robotics lab and i said well where's your where's your network and they just pointed up and said it's up there you know, we have a partner that provides it so we're a little bit of have that too however i've spoken to people are aware and the robotics people are aware it's just they don't solve this yet so mm -hmm. we're also at that but i'll tell you from a year ago when people absolutely oh we're not focused at all on it now other people's products are beginning to roll out and they're beginning to understand what's needed so there's a lot of conversation new markets are that way there has to be you know some real um awareness and understanding before it gets adopted so right yeah, right so, so oh, go sorry. ahead johnny no, but, right. It's just very, very true, though, that uh, as we look at, let's just call it the computer, the dumb computer and, and, and the mainframe, that there is there are some companies that want to move back to internal internal cloud. So that they would like to have all of their data self-secured in their building and not and not going along in the cloud. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't interact with their data. Okay, but certainly, as we like to say, as 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 the hacks become more <laughs> more interesting, uh, then why not have your own personal mainframe in your house or your home, own personal mainframe, mm. you know, uh, in in your business? Well, the disadvantage of that is that it can be lost, right, due to fire or whatever have you. But have you seen any of the movement back to personal mainframes or, or clouds at all? No, I think there's some companies that are still maintaining um, software providers that have a business there, but it's not a growing business is what I understand. Um, what the problem is there is just as these, these companies that I talked to, one was a um, very high-end security camera company that said, oh, we just have a closed system, no problems. And they were hacked. The, this world is becoming a system of systems. It's becoming a connected world where data is going to be shared from any device to any place and it needs to be secured. So whatever system that we don't recognize today needs it can get it tomorrow. You know, if you if we look at the, the utopia in the future, data has to be open beyond the bounds of the enterprise and beyond the bounds of a home and be able to flow but have the protection needed so that unauthorized and people who don't have the permissions to, to have it and use it can't see it. We can put data on a machine. And if you don't have authorization, even if you own that machine, you can't use the data, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and this is one of the things that really fascinated me about Konami when I met them, because I work in the automotive industry and automotive companies need to share data with one another, but it's literally many places it's just cut off. They can't send the data because they'll, they're will they afraid that uh, they'll lose control over it. So even on a foreign known device, if Konami system protects your data. Hmm. And that, that opens up collaboration. You know, this is the, this is the world where we say collaboration means innovation. Well, you want to be able to collaborate with your partners and not be close, be able to change those relationships and have the data protected at the same time, no matter well, that's where. Still, 
that's certainly true for open innovation and a movement of open innovation also. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in terms of uh, your fail proof, quote unquote, uh, data security, what kind of technologies, um, uh, are they evolving technologies? Do they come from the military? to secure that data. The the CTO of the company and the other co-founders came from Veritas and Symantec. Mm -hmm. um, and those companies are, you know, longtime data protection. So they understood that and um, are working from there. So they're, they've been around almost as long as I have been. So, so mm -hmm. the deep experience and that's real. So that's where the, um, they came from and that's commercial enterprise more I, I know those companies serve dod as well but it's really was commercial so when you talk to clients now and talk to and talk about your secure data and the movement of data are they are they really really ready to join are they really to if, move into the context of the flow of data so they can learn more themselves what what did this have to do with competition for example if if they have a problem that is, you know, it's always, you have to have solve a problem that's big enough that someone's willing to pay for it, right? So in security and data, a lot of times it has to do with saving human lives. You know, autonomous vehicles have to be, they've had to pull back programs, GM and crews from their robo taxis here in Austin because of, and, and San Francisco was another test market because of some traffic jam issues. And then there was a problem that, uh, of a pedestrian being injured. The traffic jam problems had to do with the network um, availability. Mm -hmm. And Konami operates on any network, any type of storage. And so when the internet bandwidth was soaked up in San Francisco, that was the problem there from concert goers, the, the, car stopped. They couldn't yeah. get the instructions they needed to manage the situation. Um, Konami can make cars potentially, we haven't done this, but potentially the, every device is a node in our system. I understand. So, yeah. So the um, autonomous vehicle can be a node and can be a hotspot and temporarily build connections with the other cars so they can have um, share data about their the locale and the surroundings and move out of that traffic jam situation. So, you know, public trust is a big problem with the, the self-driving cars now. Um, sure. They need to have availability all the time. Yeah, that's data but, science coming right out of physics and nodes and, uh, and constructive holes and they, and, and they provide other nodes and networking. I like mm -hmm. that. Go ahead, somebody else had a question, I'm sorry. Well, uh, I'm interested in, in automated cars. I think they're coming. I think we'll get past that. There's been a big recall today, I think, of Tesla. It's recalled 2 million vehicles, <laughs> uh, largely because of some rather devastating uh, uh, dash cam footage of uh, a Tesla uh, in a, an unregulated area on a country road. Uh, but the impact of this is going to be huge, the job impact. What's it going to do to the insurance industry? We're not going to have as many crashes. When we get a totally automated transportation system, we won't need car insurance. Uh, we won't need a lot of collision repair shops either. So it's going to be a huge social impact. Uh, and uh, of course, taxi drivers, Uber drivers, and a great many delivery drivers will be out of work. Um, uh, that's really interesting to me, the social impact, and I'm sure it's coming, and I don't think we can avoid it. We can ameliorate it if we can find alternative work. Otherwise, we've got a severe national problem, and that extends to the application of, uh, of AI to a whole bunch of service jobs beyond insurance. So, yeah, I don't think it's going to happen all at once and i i think it'll take quite a while um the promises of, of the self-driving cars of course are huge and it brings mobility to people who um couldn't get around before as well as allows things like ride sharing which so i don't think uber and so on are going to be out you know the the thing that was curious to well, me, i don't think uber is going to stop i think the drivers are going to be out they uh, 
Oh, yeah, that's true. Now, this goes into something that Andre said, unveiled your smart uh, poll a year ago at Cedar. And those are going to be the network for autonomous vehicles in the future. And it's going to take a while. So this the thing that I sometimes think about is, well, cities will be able to manage to some degree. How do we get between, how do we deal with the network needs between cities? And here in Texas, everything is spread out. It's not like the East Coast where, where I was used to being able to drive through a, three states in a day, um, maybe more, but. Yeah, very true, very true. But so, on the other hand, let's talk about this, uh, Llewellyn. Maybe it'll be like an airline industry. Right now, I call it a pilot, a passenger. Maybe the Uber drivers would have to be there to unload and just sit there and watch the truck move around. Well, it, it it will be different, and I'm I'm you. It's very dangerous to uh, extrapolate, um, you know, in a linear way. You've got to try to do it uh, uh, and think of all the possibilities, which you can't. So at some point, you've got to put that effort aside and let things evolve. I, I like to think of it, had we stood at Kitty Hawk when the Wright brothers perfected multi-dimensional control of an aircraft, they didn't. In how it flew was known, how you controlled it was what was not known. Uh, and you thought, what will we need for the future? We'll need aluminum, we'll need high quality, we'll need radio, radar, etc. You couldn't do it. Exponential thinking, and you could have, you know, tried very hard to be exponential, but you couldn't possibly conceive the impact, as we could not conceive the impact of the cell phone. I bought one of the first portables. It was a huge thing in a suitcase, which cost uh, an arm and over. I mean, it was too heavy to transport, and we sent it back after a while because we had no use. Uh, and then a, a, a friend of mine had a cell, uh, satellite phone, which you went outside. It was in the in the northwest. And it was in the desert, and you you held it up to make a phone call. Uh, so, you know, things evolve, and, but these things, this particularly, has evolved very, very quickly and become absolutely the life changer in every possible way. Uh, so that the speed with which uh, uh, things are deployed is variable. Uh, there is no standard rate of deployment. We deployed electricity surprisingly quickly, considering how much infrastructure electricity needs. Electricity needs a lot more infrastructure than almost anything, and yet from its invention, it started to be pretty ubiquitous, and very fast. I think one thing that is interesting about the insurance uh, is that there's so much date, personal data that um, can be gotten about somebody's driving and insurance companies offer in some cases reduction of rates if you open up your driving data. So um, maybe there will be more insurance based on driving record. It's not good. I don't think the... I don't know. The jury's out on it, but I don't think that will driving vehicles without at least someone there for emergency is when will that really happen? I mean, we did have these the cruise vehicles going around, but I don't know when that public trust will be there. I think it might happen faster than we think, but I don't yeah, know. With, with State Farm now, you can have your own personal data and your driving data as your rates will be reduced. You can mm -hmm. look it up on your cell phone. Right. Um, insurance companies are going to go through a radical change. I yeah. mean, they've, they've got to deal with climate change, which they have no way of quantifying. That. With, even with the help of the most sophisticated computing and AI, their actuaries are really up, up against it. And they're pulling out of states because they can't do the calculation. Not because they're not prepared to issue the insurance, but because they can't do the risk calculation on which insurance is based. And uh, Johnny, you're a you're a statistician. You know all about that, don't you? Well, yeah, I worked with I was a State Farm's major consultant for 22 years, and and you're exactly right. It's all it's all based on uh, calculating 
the prediction of what's going to happen based on what we call an underwriting. If you can't do the underwriting, then how 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 can you um, really make sure that uh, you are insuring exactly what you say you are insuring? Uh, so what insurance companies would do, uh, if 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 there's a lot of storms coming to the East Coast, well, you know, you got to do other things. And I can tell you that uh, one of the great companies, State Farm Insurance, is not only an insurance company, it's also a financial services company. So they have uh, gone out and, uh, and 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 looked at the different ways to serve their customers to make sure that the, the promise is kept in all ways. So in other words, perhaps the funding for the for the crisis would come from financial services rather than insuring the company's uh, houses themselves. So right. so they are really diversify. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. So Patricia, uh, we're looking here at the end of the program, unfortunately, and um, you mentioned that you had enjoyed Digital 360 Summit. The next edition will be in September of next year, uh, just September 24th through the 26th. Still trying to finalize the location. I suspect that you guys will be up for returning. We will, very much so. I, I can't say enough about that conference and I will give you a plug for that because a year ago I was invited uh, by one of your speakers. I hadn't been to the conference before and I think it gave me huge hope for the future. All of the research and development that's being done on some of the really difficult problems to do with the climate and energy and so on and leaving there was it was just wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we we have we, our hands in CNBC, predictive technologies. We have our hands in lots of stuff. <laughs> we 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 enjoy working with uh, leading edge folks like you and your team at Konami, and we're very excited to understand more how your journey evolves. And we are very keen on this whole thing about data at all levels, including data generated by you and me, and how that could potentially eliminate homelessness and poverty and all these things and people learn to monetize the data, secure the data and so on. And, and so I think that you guys are doing something that it seems somewhat uh, out there, but I think it's the new platforms for for managing the new goal, which is data. And, and uh, this is an explode in terms of billions of things connected, collecting data and generating petabytes, hexabytes, heptabytes, octabytes of data. And uh, it's going to be fascinating to watch this. And so it was always exciting to see another successful Austin company changing the paradigm shift, Lou Ellen. <laughs> paradigm shift, which I am now calling for a nuclear power and I have a piece in Forbes magazine, needs changing in a lot of places. Uh, so uh, I also read, I did, didn't want to mention this, but I cannot control myself. Uh, I'm not well disciplined. The people are actually leaving Austin because there's no housing. It's very hot and there's terrible traffic. And we don't want them up here because they're putting up the cost of housing. The real estate agents here are getting a lot of inquiries from Texas. Uh, oh, yeah. That's where they have, they have uh, failed the requirements to be a Texan. Get them out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Get them all out of here. Yeah, you, go you back, want to, you want to, to enjoy road. jogging, <laughs> enjoy jogging in 105 degree temperatures. Uh, uh, well, right now, right now the temperature is in the 50s, Llewellyn. and we're we're having a great time right now. Well, and uh, the uh, the are way. you jogging? Are you jogging, Andres? The thought every of day. Jogging. I would Every love day. to and see the that. And the I'd love to see <laughs> that. I could sell <laughs> and the Rangers that. <laughs> Every day, Llewellyn. Every day. All right. I've got to go, people. Thank you so much for a wonderful program. Thank you for being here. Yeah, very, absolutely. very yeah. interesting. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Johnny, thank you for singing a song, especially for me. Now, if you send me the performance check, this will be have been a wonderful afternoon. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Play, Bye Play the music. Play the music. Johnny, take us away. Play the music. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Mm.
May your days be bright. From now on, your troubles will be out of sight. And have yourself a merry little Christmas. Make the Yuletide gay. From now on, your troubles will be by the way. Here we are, as in olden days, happy golden days of yours. Faithful friends who are dear to us. They gather near once more. Through the years, we all will be together. If the faith survives, hang a shining star upon your highest bow. And have yourself a very little Christmas. Have yourself a very little Christmas tonight. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas Merry to Christmas. everyone. Thank okay. you for being with us. Thank this you. is our last broadcast of 2023 and uh we look forward to seeing you we're going to take a break and come back on january uh 17th i believe and our guest that day will be al saria the department director and chief technology executive of information services at the city of cedar park so look forward to having him on January 17th. And uh, hi, everybody. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Yep. Take bye care. Bye. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye-bye uh -huh. now.